Tonight, we will hand over power to winners in next general elections. The president promises Nigerians and the international community vows to ensure free and fair elections in 2023. People's Democratic Party says it's ready to take over power in 2023 as newly inaugurated National Working Committee is sworn in to steer the party's affairs for the next four years. Court dismisses suits challenging the dissolution of Zafar State's APC Caretaker Committee as some youths ask courts in Abuja to declare Governor May Malabuni as unfit to be national chairman of the APC Caretaker Committee. And truck crashes in southern Mexico killing at least 54 people and leaving scores more injured. Plus international news from our studio in London. On business news tonight, the Nigerian Upstream Petroleum Regulatory Commission calls for collaboration to achieve the objectives of the Petroleum Industry Act. On sports news tonight, Nigeria Super Falcons slipped to 41st position on the monthly ranking of women's football playing nations by FIFA. And from Abuja, following recent deadly attacks in Kastina and Sokoto states, the president sends security and intelligence chiefs to assess the situation for necessary action. If anyone still has doubt about whether power will be handed over to winners of the next general elections, that has been cleared by the president, who has vowed to not only do that, but to also ensure free and fair polls come 2023. President Muhammadu Buhari gave this assurance in his remark at a virtual summit for democracy organized by President Joe Biden of the United States, promising Nigerians and the international community that there will be a peaceful transfer of power. In a statement released after the virtual summit, the president explains, as we count down to our next general elections in 2023, we remain committed to putting in place and strengthening all necessary mechanisms to ensure that Nigeria will not only record another peaceful transfer of power to an elected democratic government, but will also ensure that elections are conducted in a free, fair and transparent manner. He also promises that Nigeria will continue to support the democratization processes in West Africa and the African continent, expressing regret that the democratic gains of the past decades in the region are currently under threat. According to President Buhari, the security challenges facing the nation poses a threat to democracy. He calls on global partners to support Nigeria's efforts in tackling insurgency and terrorism. He notes that Nigeria has had over two decades of uninterrupted democratic governance and remains committed to upholding the core values and principles of democracy. And staying with the 2023 elections contest, the main opposition party, the People's Democratic Party, appears poised to give the ruling All Progressives Congress a run for its money. Well, this comes as the PDP today swore in a new National Working Committee to pilot the affairs of the party for the next four years and lead the PDP to victory in 2023. The PDP lost election at the centre in 2015 after ruling for 16 years and has since then remained in opposition. It's a full house as leaders of Nigeria's main opposition party, the People's Democratic Party, converge in the main hall of the International Conference Center in Abuja to inaugurate the new national officers of the party. Some serving and former governors, national assembly members and the two former vice presidents of Nigeria are in attendance. <laughs> One after another, Members of the National Working Committee of the party file out to receive their certificate of return. The oath of office is then administered on them, birthing a new leadership for the PDP. Of the People's Democratic Party and the Federal Republic of Nigeria. So help me God. Amidst the ecstasy that comes with the new office, chairman of the 2021 PDP convention reminds the officers of the tasks ahead. 
we have as a national convention committee worked hard to reduce the internal squabbles within the party, but we must not assume that every tension has been subdued. There are still much to repair, much to restore, much to heal, much to build, and much to gain. The 21 new national officers are to pilot the affairs of the party through the next general elections. But what would they be doing differently to win power at the center in 2023? Under the new NWC, PDP will strengthen its internal democratic processes, we shall endeavor to reach out to all party members, we shall return the party to vigorous discussions, pay serious attention to new thinking. Having lost in the last two general elections, the task before the new leadership of the PDP is clear-cut. The PDP is ready now to really bring back Nigeria and restore where we should be. We know the task ahead. We are sure this time round we'll deliver to Nigerians. So I think this is a good sign for Nigeria. It's a good omen for Nigeria, both for our partners outside the country, for the business community, for young people who are looking for jobs. The party is ready now to lead Nigeria in the right direction. As the ceremony ends, many party faithful leave with high expectations, which will be subjected to tests in the coming days, as the party prepares for the 2023 general elections. And to the judiciary, a federal high court sitting in Gusso, the Zamfara state capital, has dismissed the suit filed by 10 former All Progressives Congress local government chairmen in the state, challenging the dissolution of the state's caretaker committee of the party. The former APC council chairman had instituted the suit against the Governor May Malabuni-led APC National Caretaker Extraordinary Convention Planning Committee. The suit filed by one Abdulaziz Dan Maliki and nine others in July 28, 2021, had Governor Buni as first defendant, the APC as second defendant, and the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, as third defendant. They pray the court to nullify the dissolution as well as order INEC not to accept or deal with any other state officers other than the plaintiffs. However, the presiding judge, Justice Aminu Bapa, in his ruling, held that the Federal High Court has no jurisdiction over the internal affairs of a political party. In the meantime, while it may be victory for the May uh, Booney led committee in Zamfara, the Yobe state governor has another legal battle to fight. This time, a group of youths in the APC has approached the Federal High Court Abuja seeking a declaration that the governor cannot hold an executive position and at the same time be the party's national chairman, caretaker, extraordinary convention planning committee. The group led by a former governorship aspirant in Kogi State, Mustafa Audu, is also seeking a declaration that his position as a governor and at the same time as the national chairman for the convention contravenes various sections of the 1999 constitution as amendment as amended rather and the constitution of the party Staying with the judiciary, Justice Hakim Oshodi of the Lagos State High Court in Ikeja has fixed February the 25th, 2022, to deliver judgment in the case of alleged kidnap kingpin Chikwe Dumeme Nwamadike, also known as Evans, and five others charged with conspiracy and kidnapping. Justice Oshodi fixed the date after lawyers to Evans and his co-defendants argued and adopted their final written addresses today. The Lagos state government had arraigned Evans alongside five others on February 14, 2017. Evans is also facing similar charges before Justice Ulua Tongi Taiwo and Justice Adidayo Akitoye of the same court. All the defendants pleaded not guilty to the charges. While arguing his final written address, Evans's lawyer, Victor Para, urged the court to discharge and acquit his clients of the crimes arguing that there was no direct evidence linking events to the alleged crimes and that the alleged victim of the crime did not identify the defendant as the perpetrator of the crimes.
and away from the courtroom. The president is looking to accord additional financial support to the National Human Rights Commission in order to assuage the grievances of Nigerians. President Mohamedou Buhari gave this indication when he received in audience members of the governing council of the commission. His response comes on the heels of calls by the commission for more funds to enable the fulfillment of Nigeria's international obligation. Our State House correspondent Gloria Mizuke reports. The president has not hidden his stance on the promotion of human rights in the country and so receiving an audience members of the National Human Rights Commission at the State House. He makes his intentions even more clear. How I wish people will understand and appreciate uh, the commission and pass the representations through you so that I will have less hectic time in government. Human Rights Commission uh, funding. We'll try and see which minister is supposed to be working with you and find out um, within our limited resources what we can honestly do for you. The meeting comes against the backdrop of the commemoration of the Human Rights Day observed by the international community on December 10. On the activities, challenges and opportunities. According to the commission, there is need for more intervention. The Commission also takes seriously the Vienna Declaration, a national plan of action adopted by the World Conference on Human Rights in Austria. So we come to you today, Mr. President, with this draft national action plan developed through a conscious, participatory, consultative and collaborative approach with its implementation plan is a living document, which is a major fulfillment of Nigeria's international obligations to promote, protect, and fulfill all human rights. Upon the approval of Mr. President and the Federal Executive Council, this action plan will be implemented by line ministries, departments, and agencies, and other non-state actors, such as civil society and development partners. Already, there are offices in each geopolitical zones to especially address issues of human rights and the implications of it, including cases of banditry, kidnapping, drug abuse, access to justice, health care, and other social services. From the presidential villa, Gloria Umezuke, Channels Television News. Meanwhile, as Nigeria joins the rest of the world to mark this year's International Human Rights Day, the National Human Rights Commission is asking Nigerians to embrace equality as this will reduce frictions and promote peace within the country. These were the words of the Executive Secretary of the Commission at a forum to mark the day in Abuja. The day was also celebrated with a walk by the Commission. <laughs> The International Human Rights Day is celebrated every December 10th to commemorate the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights by the United Nations General Assembly in 1948. In the nation's capital, the National Human Rights Commission organized a walk through major streets to raise awareness on the need to uphold the rights of all. Shortly after the rally, the director in charge of women and children, Mr. Ari Obey, reaffirms the commission's resolve towards seeking justice for all victims of human rights abuses. Thereafter, they proceed for a lecture and the focal point of discussion here centers on equal treatment of everyone in the society, irrespective of age and status and violence against women and children. Let this year's team resonate in all the high and small places of our society. From the little corners of our homes, where the societal values are baked, to our schools and institutions of learning, which is presently challenged by the issues of bullying and other disturbing vices. Let the focus be on reduction of inequalities as we seek to advance human rights in all our dreams. You will agree with me that Nigeria is facing a lot of challenges and until we address the issues of all forms of violence against women, we will not make significant progress. The United States used the occasion to reiterate its commitment to the rights of Nigerians. 
as it watches keenly the reports from the NSAS panel. We are focused on the next steps in government follow-up on the various NSARS panels, including the Lucky Tollgate incident. We fully support the government's police reform program and have ongoing programs that increase capacity and professionalism of the police and military. The team for this year's celebration, reducing inequalities and advancing human rights, many years say is timely in addressing the prevalence of human rights abuses in the country. In part two after the break, tributes pour in for former Justice of the Supreme Court, Justice Bolaiwa Babalaki, who died last week. The president describes him as an outstanding public servant. Please stay with us. Welcome back. If you just joined us, you're watching the news at 10 live on Channel's television, Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. The president promises Nigerians and the international community that he will hand over power to winners in the next general elections and vows to ensure free and fair polls in 2023. PDP says it's ready to take over power come 2023 as the party's newly inaugurated National Working Committee is sworn in. Court dismisses suits challenging the dissolution of Zamfara State's APC, APC Caretaker Committee as some youths ask a court in Abuja to declare Governor May Malabuni as unfit to be National Chairman of APC Caretaker Committee. And truck crashes in southern Mexico, killing at least 54 people and living scores more injured. It's over to our Abuja studios where Gloria Mazoke has some more stories. Hi, Gloria. Hello, Millicent. Good to see you. We'll begin from the presidency. In response to the recent striking bandits' activities in the northwest, the president has dispatched a high level delegation made up of the heads of the nation's intelligence and security services to Sokoto and Katsina states. According to the delegation, the president is expecting an immediate situation report and recommendations on actions to follow to effectively deal with the worrying situation. The delegation was led by the National Security Advisor, Major General Babagana Munguno. This has illuminated the need for all of us in this country, whatever agency, whatever organization or institution, to understand the gravity of this sort of incident and to ensure not only to forestall such incidents in the future but to actually reach an end state in which these things do not happen. Nevertheless, Mr. President wants me and the members of our delegation to reassure you of his commitment to ensure safety and security for individuals and also for institutions. The delegation was also in Sokoto State where it assured of the federal government's resolve to deal with all troublemakers, bandits and insurgents that are disturbing the peace of the nation. For the Sokoto State Governor, more resources are needed to combat the menace. It does appear as if those bandits pursued from the first state have relocated to Sokoto State. This is a very, very serious call for concern. I appeal, therefore, to you and through you to Mr. President, Commander-in-Chief, to deploy more resources to Sokoto State, more boots on the ground. I am familiar with the situation at the center, but I believe that something can be done, and that should be done urgently and expeditiously, because our situation is really getting out of hand. We, Mr. NSA, as we have said before, need to do more on deployment of technology in this fight. This is not a normal fight, you know better than I do, so we need more of technology than not even, not even the personnel. We need both, but we need to really, really do more about uh, deploying technology. Every life of every citizen is important, and it gives great concern to Mr. President that needless losses of lives are occurring. 
Mr. President wants me to convey to Your Excellency his, his profound condolence over the loss of all the citizens who have departed. He, he wants us to also express his deep sympathy as well as his determination that the perpetrators of these very gruesome, wicked activities are apprehended and brought to book. The very fact that the top most echelon of security in the country is here is an indicator that Mr. President wants us to address these issues so that some form of comfort is given to the people of Sokoto State by a definite closure, by a definite process in concluding what has happened to these unfortunate innocent citizens. For more on security matters, the Imo State Police Command has confirmed the gruesome murder of the traditional ruler of Atta Ancient Kingdom in Jaba, local government area of Imo State, Edwin Azike, by gunmen. According to the Imo State Police Command Public Relations Officer, Mr. Abatam, the lifeless body of the traditional ruler was identified and recovered inside his vehicle along the road leading to the market square in the community on Friday morning after he was abducted on Thursday night. Meanwhile, according to eyewitness account, four other persons were killed in the community during the attack. This development is coming less than 24 hours after another traditional ruler in Mbutu ancient kingdom of Abo in the local government area of Imo state, Damian Nguigwe, was abducted from his palace. To health matters now, the desire for transformational health care and improved service delivery in the nation's health sector is the motivation for the establishment of the Oludolako Akinkube Pharmacy Education Trust. The foremost industrialist and pioneer in the field, Chief Olu Dolapo Akinkube, has lent his name to the vision. Well, this was the consensus of speakers at the launch of the Education Trust in Lagos. Other senior citizens in the mold of the doyen of Nigeria's pharmaceutical field have converged here to honor him at the launch of the Olu Akinkube Pharmacy Education Trust, OAPET. The launch of OAPET is timely, coming just days after the foundation lane of the Olu Akikube Faculty of Pharmacy in the University of Medical Sciences, Ondo State, the project for which the trust has been designed to fund. Elder statesmen, including former ministers of Petroleum and Health, Philip Asiodu, and Prince Julius Adelusi Adewi, took turns to endorse the Oapet as a worthwhile legacy from the man they describe in glowing terms. He was able to contribute so much, not only to the pharmacy sector, but he became chairman and guided, and I sat on some of his boards. There was the Nigeria Academy of Pharmacy, and you were one of the first fellows and you are indeed the only pharmacist who has been given a Life Achievement Award by that academy. The nonagenarian is honored with a medallion by the Nigeria Association of Pharmacists for being the oldest living past president of the association. Going down memory lane, Chief Akikube in his remarks said he started out as a reluctant pharmacist. I thought pharmacy was going to be a step to another, another profession. I did not understand that it was my God-ordained profession. And the more I tried to move away, the more I found opportunities which kept, kept me within pharmacy. The OAPET vision has the unwavering support of the Ondo state government, a message conveyed to the faculty by Governor Rotimi Akiridulu, who was represented at the launch by his deputy, Lucky Ayedatiwa. We will do all within our capacity to make the dream of this faculty a reality in the soonest time possible. As she speaks, 
there's going to be... Members of the faculty extol the contributions of Chief Akikube, not just to the field of pharmacy, but also to nation building. All the medical areas that have been largely neglected would be focused on. So I think it's a fantastic legacy. Within the Ondo community comes very well uh, respected. The OAPET launch rounds off on a high note with the painting of Chief Akikube done by another pharmacist and artist, Francis Gide, in six minutes. Well, that's it from the nation's capital. It's back to Millicent for more on the rest, the rest of the news at 10. Thank you, Gloria. And a former justice of the Supreme Court, Justice Bolayu Ababalaki, who died last week, was an outstanding public servant of repute who lived an exemplary life worthy of emulation. This is the message from President Muhammadu Buhari to his family. The message was delivered at the Babalakin's Lagos home by a three-man delegation led by the Minister of Works and Housing, Mr. Babatunde Fashola. Our judiciary correspondent, Shala Shueli, reports. The late Supreme Court Judge Justice Balarinwa Babalaki was called to the bar in England in the 1950s. On his return to Nigeria, he practiced as a very successful legal practitioner before he was appointed in 1975 as a judge of the High Court of Western State and former Oyo State. In 1983, he was elevated to the Court of Appeal and was reputed for his integrity, discipline, punctuality and fairness. He was eventually appointed to the Supreme Court from where he retired in 1992 at the age of 65. An illustrious career which spanned over 40 years, he held several appointments and was conferred with many honors, including Commander of the Federal Republic, CFR. In honor of this outstanding jurist who died on December 4th at the age of 94, the federal government has sent a delegation to pay a condolence visit to his family. They are received by the eldest son of the jurist, the chairman of By Courtney Aviation Services, senior advocate of Nigeria, Wali Babalaki. <laughs> The three-man delegation is led by the Minister of Works and Housing, Babatunde Fashola. Other members of the team are the Minister of Youth and Sports, Sunday Dari, and the Special Advisor to the President on Media, Femi Adishino. Mr. Fashola proceeds to deliver the President's message. Convey the very deep condolences of Mr. President and the Federal Government. Nigeria has lost an outstanding public servant of example. We want to express our profound gratitude to the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, President Muhammad Buhari, for deeming it fit to send condolences to a public servant who left service 29 years ago. <laughs> the eight-day fidel prayers for the late Justice Balariwa Babalaki will hold in Bogor or Shun State on Sunday, December the 12th. Shola Shoyeli, Channels Television News. When the news at 10 returns, the Nigerian Upstream Petroleum Regulatory Commission calls for synergy to achieve the objectives of the Petroleum Industry Act. That's on Business News. Do join us again. Fifteen-year-old Izdeaku Esther, a student of his Grace High School in Ugu State, has emerged the overall winner with the best essay in the United Bank for Africa National Essay Competition, carting away educational grant of three million naira to study at any African university of her choice, among other gifts. The UBA Foundations, the corporate social responsibility CSR arm of the United Bank for Africa, held the grand finale of the 11th National Essay Competition at the Amphitheatre of the UBA House in Lagos in a ceremony attended by students, staff and parents. It's said that education is the passport to the future, for tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it today. And that's what the UBA Foundation is promoting as it welcomes finalists of the 11th 
UBA annual national essay competition. This year, we went fully digital. This is the first year that we have gone fully digital with the national essay competition. So it's, it's taken a new course. You know, we're still expecting people to put in handwritten essays so that we can see the authenticity of your work so that you're not using spell checks and you know, all those other things that students uh, do these days that make life so much easier. With the annual competition having produced hundreds of winners, some of whom have long graduated from higher schools, this year's competition has 12 finalists. The MD of UBA praises their efforts. You heard the numbers from 7,000 who are down to 12. That's already just up. And we're very and extremely proud of every one of you. And clearly, you are now ambassadors of the United Bank for Africa. From the top three, 15-year-old Eziaku Esther, a student of his Grace High School in Ugu State, emerges the overall winner with the best essay. Esther goes home with an educational grant of 3 million naira to study at any African university of her choice, plus a brand new state-of-the-art laptop and many other educational tools from UBA Foundation. First, I made the right test because I know that out of the 7,000, they are looking for something special, something different from what others write because it's not just writing, it's hitting the point. So I thought, let me do mine a different way. Let me, just, let me not just write an essay. Let me write something creative, something different. So I did that and look at where I am today. The UBA Foundation's education initiative has been changing lives for over a decade as the tertiary education scholarship program continues to impact the lives of many students and their communities. Congratulations to her. For more business news, here's Teniola Shibawali. Thanks a lot, Millicent. Welcome to Business News. The Nigerian Upstream Petroleum Regulatory Commission has called for collaboration among stakeholders in the country's oil and gas sector. The NUPRC Chief Executive Officer, Mr. Binga Komolafe, who made the call, stressed the importance of collaboration in the sector to achieve the objectives of the Petroleum Industry Act. According to him, the PIA seeks to increase oil and gas reserves, reduce operating costs as well as attract investments to the sector. Mr. Komolafe, however, adds that the Commission would ensure strict implementation of environmental policies, laws and regulations for upstream petroleum operations. The Court of Appeal, Lagos Division, has rejected an appeal by the chairman of Global Fleet Group, Mr. Jimo Ibrahim, challenging the Asset Management Corporation of Nigeria's Amcon seizure of its assets over his alleged 69.4 billion naira debt. This was disclosed today in a statement by the Amcon spokesman, Judon Wauzo, who described the court's unanimous decision to uphold the authorized asset takeover as another victory for Amcon and good news to the recovery drive of the government. Amcon, following Justice Akawa's order, took effective possession of all 12 properties, which include the Narcon Investment Limited building in Abuja. Food and agri-allied group Flour Mills of Nigeria PLC has once again rewarded outstanding customers during an annual customer forum and awards ceremony in Lagos. According to the management of the company, the event is organized yearly to appreciate and reassure their trade partners of their relationship. It's another annual celebration of outstanding business-to-business -business customers of Food and Agro-Allied Group, Far Mills of Nigeria PLC. Uh, that would be answering our questions. Esteemed uh, trade partners of the company from across have, the country uh, are recognized and rewarded no, for their loyalty and support uh, you know, over the years of the 2021 B2B Customers Forum and Awards Ceremony. These events are very special because it enables us to reset, to course correct, and to do the right thing and to take the partnership to another level. And that's our commitment for today. 
Number one, National. Number one, Lagos. West, number two. East one, number three. Top awardees are selected from the East, West, and North under regional and national categories, receiving either 200 bags of flour or 12, 15, or 20 tons of diesel engine trucks. Flour Mills is a company that is customer-centric. We believe very much that our customers are partners with us. And uh, because they are key stakeholders, we believe that for everything we do, we need to make sure that we carry them along. And so on a yearly basis, we take our time to uh, conduct a customer forum where we bring our customers together, first and foremost, to celebrate them, to thank them for their business, and then to reassure them about the fact that we continue to see them as uh, partners and that we are working together for the good of the company. In that hall, we have some of the biggest businesses uh, in the country, uh, and yet there's a humility, there's a listening, and a true partnership is a two-way street. And we have to open our ears at Flower Mills and, and listen, and, and we both invest in this to take it to the next level. The National Awardees are excited for this recognition by the company. I feel happy, I feel uh, appreciated, I feel compensated, and I'm glad that uh, all my hard work by His Grace is being, um, is being um, compensated. Well, I feel so happy and I thank God for this opportunity. Because I've been in this business for the past um, 28, 29 years and uh, so far so good, I'm so happy. Flower Mills of Nigeria has been doing business in Nigeria for over 60 years with huge investment in the food and agro-allied industry. The equities market made a rebound in today's trading session as it rose by 0.47%. Ini John Nekwa tells us more. Thank you so much and welcome to the stock market report. Well, this week's trading ends with bullish sentiment, a sharp departure from yesterday with 103 billion naira added to the total market cap. Investors can have a cherry weekend while the bull rests on the floor of the NGX. Once again, the banking sector shines with its index up over 2%. Oil and gas comes close with a gain of 1.30% and consumer goods up 0.24%. Worth mentioning here is Guinness, which gained 2 naira 50 carbon share price today. Top trades by volume and value has the trail of CNI leasing access and FBN holding with a combined volume of about 330 million shares traded in 390 deals. At the close of trading, over 20 stocks gained and 13 lost. Another positive for the market today. That's the Stock Market Report. I'm Ini John Mekwa. And that's Business News tonight. It's back to Millicent for the rest of the News at 10. Thank you, Taniola. Still ahead on the News at 10, truck crashes in southern Mexico, killing at least 54 people and leaving scores more injured. And more international news from our studio in London. Please stay with us. Authorities have confirmed that most of the 54 people killed after a truck full of migrants flipped over in southern Mexico were Guatemalans. The accident is one of the deadliest involving migrants in the country in decades. For more on this and other international news, here's Simon Pusey with Around the World in Five. Good evening and welcome to the Channel Studios here in London with your international news around the world in five. At least 54 people have been killed and scores more injured after the truck they were being transported in crashed in southern Mexico. Pictures show victims strewn across the road next to the overturned truck. More than 150 people, said to be migrants from Central America, were crammed into the truck's trailer when it rolled in the state of Chiapas. Some 105 people, 83 men and 22 women, were also injured in the crash. It is one of the worst accidents of its kind in Mexico. The High Court in the UK has ruled that WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange can be extradited from the UK to the US. The US won its appeal against a January UK court ruling that he could not be extradited due to concerns over his mental health. 
Judges were reassured by U.S. promises to reduce the risk of suicide. This goes to the fundamentals of press freedom and of democracy. His fiancée said they intended to appeal. Seven years without charge. Mr. Assange is wanted in the U.S. over the publication of thousands of classified documents in 2010 and 2011. The United Nations Human Rights Office says Myanmar's military is committing grave violations, including killing 11 people and setting fire to their bodies. We're appalled by the alarming escalation of grave human rights abuses. At a Geneva briefing, the body's right, spokesperson the said security. there was an alarming escalation of human rights abuses in Myanmar. It comes days after democratically elected leader Aung San Suu Kyi was sentenced to a further four years in prison. There was no immediate reaction from Myanmar's military rulers to the accusations from the UN. Russia's Ministry of Defense have released a video of what they say were several U.S. and French fighter jets and a refueling aircraft escorted by three Russian military aircrafts. The ministry said the jets were approaching Russia's border over the Black Sea. An armed forces spokesman said the French planes were carrying out a NATO observation mission under international regulations. Such interactions are not uncommon, with similar incidents previously happening, but they do come amid tensions between the West and Russia in the region. South African scientists see no sign that the Omicron coronavirus variant is causing more severe illness than its predecessors. Although scientists say more time is needed to arrive at a definite conclusion, the country's health minister said the signs of severity were positive. In terms of the symptoms we have... It has officials announced a plan to roll out vaccine boosters with daily infections approaching an all-time high. Hospital data shows that COVID-19 admissions are now rising sharply in more than half of the country's nine provinces, but deaths are not rising as dramatically. Ghana is demanding that all adult travellers flying into the country provide proof of full vaccination. Ghanaian citizens and residents abroad are exempt for up to two weeks, but will be required to get jabbed upon landing at the airport. The authorities say they are concerned about a surge of infections over the festive period. The measures are some of the strictest in the world. All Ghanaians flying out of the country will also need to show proof of vaccination. French President Emmanuel Macron has welcomed Germany's new Chancellor Olaf Scholz for an inaugural working meeting at the Elysee Presidential Palace in Paris. The two most powerful EU leaders will begin the search for common ground to tackle issues within the bloc and beyond. Heading the agenda will be tensions over Ukraine and Macron's priorities for France's six-month European Union presidency, which starts on January the 1st. A massive water spout has momentarily appeared off the coast of Ostia near Rome. A video uploaded on social media shows the phenomenon, also known as a whirlwind over water, reaching from the surface of the sea into the clouds. Local media reported it lasted for about 15 minutes. Eyewitnesses reported a second minor water spout shortly afterwards before strong winds, hail and rain hit the region. And finally, move over reindeer because Santa has a new mode of transport. Father Christmas is now travelling by helicopter, at least in Guatemala. He was visiting children with cancer in Ciudad de Mico. The charity event supports cancer patients from remote villages in Guatemala and provides accommodation for parents as their children receive treatment. And that's your international news around the world in five. Now back to the Channel Studios. Welcome to Sports News. Nigeria Super Falcons have slipped in the latest FIFA ranking for women's football playing nations. Falcons dropped from 38 to 41 in the world, but retained number one sport in Africa. Since the last ranking in August, the Falcons have played four matches, including international friendlies, where they lost to South Africa 4-2 and beat Mali 2-0. Ahead of uh, Steven Gerrard's return to Anfield as Aston Villa's coach, Liverpool manager Jurgen Klopp believes the Reds legend will take charge of the Middleside club in the near future. Klopp, whose team um, heads into Saturday's game in second place in the Premier League, is looking forward to Gerrard's visit with Villa. Gerrard won numerous trophies in 17 years at Anfield and will take on his boiled club for the first time as a manager. Spain's top football clubs have approved a 1.994 billion euros investment from private equity fund CVC Capital Partners in the first deal of its kind in Europe, though four clubs, including Barcelona and Real Madrid, opted out. 
37 clubs voted in favor of the La Liga boost deal that buys CVC an 8.2% stake in a new company that will get revenues from La Liga broadcasting and sponsorship rights. The objecting clubs will not take any share of the CVC investment, though they will continue to receive the allocated share of TV rights money. CVC has invested in Formula One, MotoGP and Rugby. That will be all on sports. It's back to you, Melissa. Thank you, Chris. And the main news again. The president today promised Nigerians and the international community that he will hand over power to winners in the next general elections and vow to ensure free and fair elections come 2023. And that's the news at 10 tonight. But just before we go on a programming note, our exclusive interview with the British High Commissioner to Nigeria, Katriona Ling, on the UK government's decision to place the country on its travel red list, as well as the principle of reciprocity, among other diplomatic issues, is tonight by 11.30 p.m. in place of a repeat program special report. It's only on channels television. It's 30 minutes from now. Thank you for watching. I'm Melissa Tumwaka. Enjoy your weekend. Stay safe. Thank you.